At the end of this talk, I want to convince all of you that aliens do exist, and it's only a matter of time before we find them. But first, we must understand just how large the universe is. Why? Because at the near infinite scales of the universe, aliens are almost guaranteed. The universe is so large that at its true scale, we can't even begin to comprehend its size. So I'm going to change scales. On the slide is our star, the sun. It is so massive that you could fit a million Earths into it. Now I'm going to compress the size of the star, sun into this tennis ball. How big would Earth have to be for a million of them to fit in this tennis ball? The Earth would be a grain of sand. Pause for a moment and picture that. Our Earth, a mere grain of sand, orbiting our sun, a tennis ball, from 10 meters away, being held by nothing but gravity. If that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will. If we move a kilometer away from this tennis ball, we will arrive at the agreed upon edge of the solar system. This is also where you'd find Voyager 1. Now, Voyager 1 is the man-made object that is furthest from Earth. At this scale, a mere kilometer is the furthest human creation has ever been. We still have a long way to go. Our next big landmark is Alpha Centauri, our nearest visible star. At this scale, Alpha Centauri would be another tennis ball, a whopping 2,000 kilometers away. Here's a map for reference with a circle of radius 2,000 kilometers centered at this room. Humans going to Alpha Centauri would be like tiny people living on a grain of sand in this room, going all the way to the edges of this circle. It would be, how hard would it be for those people to leave their grain of sand and leave this room and go all the way to China? Now you may think you have begun to understand just how large the universe is and just how hard it is to travel across it. But we can get even bigger. This is our galaxy, the Milky Way. It spans 100,000 light years in diameter. Now, if the term light year confuse you, don't worry, because when I first heard it, I was confused too. A light year is not a unit of time, but it's a unit of distance. It's the distance traveled by light, the fastest thing there is, is in an entire year. It's about 9 trillion kilometers. Now, if we wanted this picture to be at scale to a tennis ball sun, this picture would have to be 46 million kilometers wide. That is huge compared to how small this tennis ball is. And in this huge circle, there are over a trillion stars. And our galaxy is just one of many in the observable universe. What is the observable universe? This is an artist's representation of the observable universe. It's a sort of bubble. We cannot see beyond this bubble because there hasn't been enough time since the beginning of the universe for light to have reached us from out there. Now there is stuff beyond the observable universe, but we just can't see it. Now this bubble spans 90 billion light years in diameter. That distance is so large that even if we were to compress it to this tennis ball scale, it would be too large for us to think of. But we can think about how many galaxies there are in the observable universe. This is the Hubble Deep Field image. Now this is a patch of sky that you could cover with the nail of your pinky finger of an outstretched arm like this. Now that small patch of sky was observed by the Hubble Space Telescope for 11 days, and it took 400 pictures of it. This picture is the culmination of all of those pictures. Now the amazing thing about this picture is that except for two points of light, every single point is an entire galaxy. There are galaxies everywhere. Even the dark areas, if we look hard enough, we will see something like this. And each of these galaxies have trillions of stars. And scientists have just begun to find planets around these stars. How? So when a planet orbits a star, the star wobbles in its place slightly. Now we can analyze this wobble by looking at its light. Now its light seems to be shifting to the right and to the left periodically. Using this shift, we can deduce that there must be a planet around the star. And use, using that, we can find planets around other stars. But the problem with this is that the planet must be huge like Jupiter. If it's small like the Earth, the wobble wouldn't be big enough for us to detect. But when we're looking for life, we're looking for Earth-like planets in a specific area around the star. This area is called the habitable zone. 
The habitable zone is the area around the star where it is not too hot and not too cold, but just right for the secret ingredient of life to form, liquid water. Now, everywhere we look on Earth, the one thing that is necessary for any life seems to be water. So, and due to water's unique properties, we believe that water is essential for life everywhere. So we're looking for planets where water can form on the surface. Now, to find these planets, we have another method. It's called the transit method. Now, as you can see on the slide, when the planet passes in front of a star, the brightness dips ever so slightly. Now, we can analyze this dip in brightness and figure out how big the planet is and how far away from the star the planet is. And um, this method is sensitive enough to find Earth-like planets in the habitable zone. The planet's just right for life as we know it. But the thing is, if the planet happens to be orbiting a bit too high or a bit too low from the star, we will not detect this because, it because the brightness dip will not be seen. So we miss most planets of interest with this method. Now, although we have so many limitations, and with only a few decades of data, we were able to find 3,500 exoplanets, planets around other stars. Now, if we extrapolate this data to every single star in the universe, we can deduce that almost every star has one, if not more, planets around it. There are more planets than there are stars. This allows for a vast arena of worlds where life can potentially evolve into things we could never imagine. Now, the thing about these methods is that they help us find planets where there could potentially be water, which means that there could potentially be life on it. But we still cannot detect life for certain around another planet. There's one proposed method for this. It's to take a picture of the atmosphere of the planet. Now, if something strange is happening in the atmosphere that no phys a natural phenomena can explain, a seeming violation of the laws of physics, this is probably best explained by the existence of life on that planet. Now, we cannot, the problem with this is that we cannot take a picture of another planet's atmosphere yet. But we did this with Earth. This is a real picture of Earth taken from space by the Galileo spacecraft. And using this picture and only this, scientists were able to deduce that the Earth was probably teeming with life. Now, this may not seem like a big deal to all of you, because when you walk outside and look, there is life everywhere. But the fact that we were able to do this with only one picture and no sample from the planet means that we can apply the same method to other planets and use that to de detect life on them. Now, the, as I said before, the problem is that stars are usually a million times brighter than the planet, so we cannot take a picture of another planet yet. But there is one proposed method. This is called the star shade. This technology blocks out the light from the star, but not the planet. So we can take a picture of the planet without the glare from the star. Now, this technology will be in the telescopes to follow Hubble and Kepler. And when they are in space, we will probably hear the first news of detection of life. Now, this shouldn't come as a surprise, given the sheer number of planets out there. And this life will probably be unintelligent life, the kind of life that does not use technology but simply survives on the surface. But in this talk, we're interested in the kind of life we could communicate with, intelligent life. Now, in theory, intelligent life should be much easier to detect because they would be broadcasting some sort of signal of their existence. But the problem is, intelligent life is also much rarer to find. How, how much rarer is it? We don't know. The problem is we only have one form of life to work with, Earth life. And we do not have enough data to understand how intelligence itself grows uh, fundamentally. So this is why finding life around another planet, even if it's unintelligent, is so important. Because we could learn something fundamental of, about life that we could not have from Earth life. And using this, we could come up with better methods to find intelligent life. Now, the astronomer Frank Drake came up with an equation for the number of alien civilizations there should be in a given area of space. This is the Drake equation. Now, although it looks compl com uh, complicated, don't worry. You don't have to understand it to follow the talk. You, all you have to know is that scientists don't know the values of all of these variables. They make guesses for the possible ranges for these values. Now, even in the most pessimistic case, where life evolves into intelligence only one in a million times, 
There should be over 300,000 alien civilizations in our galaxy alone. But when we go to the countryside and look up at the stars, we see no signs of intelligence, no intergalactic wars, no empires trying to destroy the Earth because we're in the way of their highway. And most importantly, no, in, any, no sign of interstellar si uh, signals. Now, although we are pretty stupid, we seem to be the only sign of intelligence there is in the universe. Where are the aliens? A sign says they should be everywhere, but they aren't. This is a great problem in the search for life, and it is so important it even has a name. It's called the Fermi question. Now, there are many possible explanations to this apparent lack of life, from intergalactic conspiracies to empires ruling the galaxy in hiding, destroying any civilization that comes in their way. But I'm going to talk about the few most probable explanations to this. We started communicating at the fastest speed allowed by physics, the speed of light, about a century ago when we first discovered radio waves. This is when we were broadcasting signals of our existence into space at the speed of light. A mere 50 years later, we detonated our first nuclear bomb. For the first time in human history, we had the ability to destroy every last one of us. Now, the first explanation to the Fermi question goes something like this. Every time an intelligent civilization arises, it will destroy itself faster than it can move out of its planet and communicate its existence. Now, the second explanation is that aliens are probably far more advanced than us and have come up with technologies and discovered physics we haven't yet. So even if they're communicating in signals using that physics, even if they're passing Earth every single day, we would not detect them because we don't know they exist. But my favorite explanation is the limitation in space and time. Now, the universe is very large, and time is very long. But there hasn't been enough time since the potential existence of life for any signal to have reached us yet. This is best demonstrated by our own signals. That tiny yellow dot, which is magnified in that rectangle, is our radio bubble. This is how far our radio waves have traveled into space. This is the extent of human influence. Beyond that bubble, any alien civilization would not know we exist. As you can see, we have barely even begun to reach the ends of the galaxy. Forget the universe. This could be the case with other alien civilizations living in their own tiny radio bubbles scattered across the galaxy. And it could take centuries, if not millennia, before we hear the first signal from aliens. Now, whatever the reason for this lack of aliens, we're still very hopeful of finding them. We even have an organization called SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Now, these people use large arrays of very powerful radio telescopes to gather petabytes of data in search for any signal that could potentially be from aliens. Yes, you heard me right. People work full-time jobs in search for aliens. Are they crazy? No. The odds of finding aliens seem to be so high that we'd be crazy not to try. The annual budget of SETI and NASA combined in their alien searches is slightly over a billion dollars. This is nothing compared to what we spend on other things such as the military and what we could potentially learn from a detection of aliens. Our science could be potentially advanced by a few millennia. Imagine going back to the time of the Romans and handing them the smartphone. How much more, uh, how much more would they have benefited from this? Now, even not finding life would mean a great deal for science. Because if we didn't find life anywhere outside of Earth, it would mean that there's something special about Earth that allows life to form that is nowhere else in the universe. If we figure out what that is, we would learn something fundamental about the origin of life, which would revolutionize biology and even medicine. Now, perhaps the most important reason to look is our inherent curiosity to know more. We cannot quench our thirst for knowledge, especially when we are this close to knowing. With that, I'd like to leave you with this picture. It was taken by Voyager 1 25 years ago, when Voyager 1 first uh, looked back at Earth for one last time and took this picture. That tiny dot is how our planet looks out from there. Now, Carl Sagan, the astronomer, said something very profound about this, and I quote, look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, 
every human being who ever was and lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering. Thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines. Every hero and covered. Every king and peasant. Every creator and destroyer of civilization. Every superstar, including Rajnikanth. Every supreme leader. Every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a motive dust suspended in a sunbeam. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight after the sun sets, I ask you to walk outside and look up. Even if you can't see them, think about the trillions of stars out there. Many orbited by motes of dust just like our own. Each with their own histories, ideologies, and discoveries. The universe is filled with stories to tell, and all we have to do is listen. Thank you.